Welcome to the second part of our two-part video on civil liability under the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act. In the first video, we covered substantive liability under Section 1962C. In this video, we will cover civil standing under 1964C. Historically, RICO was viewed as, as a problematic claim, and that's because the civil standing provision, the civil remedies provision, was abused so much by litigators uh, looking to find a way to get treble damages or attorney's fees in cases looking to get into federal court. That gave rise to an attitude by many judges that RICO claims were a waste of time and that RICO was usually a statute that was simply abused. That uh, seems to be changing nowadays. It seems as though courts are looking at RICO as being a tool that can be effective and appropriate under the right circumstances. But as litigators, it's up to us to use RICO responsibly, which is why in the first video I emphasized over and over again not to stretch mail and wire fraud so far that you are using RICO to address problems that arise in any normal commercial setting. And I would continue to stress that here. Use RICO for the unusual. Use RICO for the egregious. Use RICO for those situations where the defendant's conduct truly warrants some kind of punitive relief. And I think if you do that uh, in this day and age, most judges will be sympathetic to the claim and will not bend over backwards to dismiss it. And I think RICO will continue to find its place in American jurisprudence. Like I said, most claims are brought under 1962C, uh, which requires that a defendant operate and manage an enterprise through a pattern of racketeering activity. Now, if you were a criminal prosecutor, you could end there. Uh, that's where substantive liability would stop. As a civil plaintiff, you have to move on to the requirements of Section 1964C. And 1964C is a relatively straightforward statute, but it still has two important conditions. Let's just read the statute to begin with. 1964C states, any person injured in his business or property by reason of a violation of 1962 of this chapter may sue, therefore, in any appropriate United States District Court and shall recover threefold the damages he sustains and the cost of the suit, including a reasonable attorney's fee. Now, the provision goes on and it talks about securities fraud. And it says that if you're going to predicate a civil RICO claim on securities fraud, you first have to have a criminal conviction for those acts of securities fraud. So that exception relates to a 1995 amendment to the civil remedies provision that essentially moved securities fraud out of the category of normal acts of racketeering activity like mail and wire fraud, bank fraud, extortion, and moved it into a class of one, uh, a class that includes only securities fraud. Securities fraud is the only act of racketeering that requires a prior criminal conviction in order to predicate a civil RICO claim on that act of racketeering. It's a fairly narrow exception. Generally speaking, there are civil remedies provisions under the Securities Exchange Act. For that reason, um, Congress amended RICO so that uh, most civil liability would be handled under the Securities Exchange Act, not RICO, because there were certain inconsistencies like the statute of limitations and causation issues that were in conflict between the Securities Exchange Act and RICO. When RICO was abused, it was generally abused in the civil context. And so when the Supreme Court and the Courts of Appeal try to limit RICO, they usually try to adopt rules that are unique to the civil standing provision. Of course, a big limitation is that that limitation on, on injury to business or property, which was part of the congressional statutory language, but also the by reason of requirement has been interpreted to impose not only an actual causation requirement, a but-for causation requirement on civil RICO plaintiffs, but also a proximate causation requirement on civil plaintiffs. And then finally, there is a different statute of limitations analysis that applies to civil RICO claims versus criminal RICO claims, and the civil rules are uh, a bit more constricted. Let's begin with, with uh, RICO's 
civil remedies provision and its limitation to injuries to business or property. Obviously what that means on its face is that a RICO plaintiff cannot seek recovery for personal injuries. If you are a murder victim, you cannot seek recovery for your wrongful death, or I should say your survivors can't seek recovery for your wrongful death. If you are an extortion victim who has been threatened by a defendant, give me a thousand dollars a month or I'll kill you, you may live with that threat for years. Uh, you may experience untold emotional distress by reason of that threat. That emotional distress is not recoverable under RICO. You can only recover injuries to your business or property. And this rule is, is, has been accepted for a very long time since RICO's ex, uh, inception because it's, it's written right into the statutory language. And it's, it's, it's a rule that, that, uh, that courts have embraced because it does limit the scope of RICO claims. The most important case under this injury to business or property exception, I would say is, is a case called Grogan versus Platt. It's a case from the 11th Circuit, 835F2nd, 844, 1988. In that case, uh, there were a group of FBI agents who were chasing a drug racket and basically had the, the kingpins cornered and a shootout occurred and several FBI agents were killed. In the aftermath, the surviving spouses of the FBI agents brought a RICO claim alleging that this drug ring engaged in a pattern of racketeering activity and that pattern included the murders, the acts of murder that resulted in the deaths of the FBI agents. And if you recall from the lecture in video one, uh, murder is an act of racketeering uh, under 1961-1. The 11th Circuit came back and said, yes, uh, you're right. The, these murders were part of the pattern of racketeering activity in which these defendants engaged. However, murder is a personal injury. It's not an injury to business or property. And although uh, the, the surviving spouses had standing under the state's wrongful death statutes, they did not have standing under RICO. The court went on to further say, the surviving spouses could, could bring a state wrongful death claim, but not a claim under RICO. In addition, the economic losses that were incidental to the deaths, such as medical expenses and lost wages, were also held to be uh, non-recoverable under RICO. And this rule that expressed in the Grogan case is pretty universal. Personal injuries simply are not compensable under RICO, neither are economic losses incidental to personal injuries. Now, yesterday, during the section on racketeering activity, I didn't discuss extortion a great deal because extortion also has a property component. And I thought it would make some sense to reserve that discussion until today. Now, under Section 1951, it prohibits extortion. And extortion is defined as obtaining the property of another with his consent induced by wrongful use of actual or threatened force, violence, fear, or under color of official right. As you see, property is also an element of an extortion uh, violation. So when you apply that definition of extortion to governmental entities, I get, I get lots of people calling and saying that they want to sue some kind of governmental entity because they are being extorted to pay taxes, they are being extorted to sell their property, under some kind of eminent domain action. They're being extorted for, for various reasons by government officials. I've had people call and complain that judges have awarded custody of their children to their ex-spouses and that constitutes extortion. Fundamentally under RICO, you, you have to stop and ask yourself what is property. Generally speaking, children are not property. So if you are forced to surrender custody of your children to an, to an ex-spouse, I think you're going to have a hard time arguing that, that you were deprived of property. When you're talking about the deprivation of some kind of civil right, like the right to free speech, that's probably not a property right. That's a civil right, but probably not a property right. And your remedies are probably going to be under the Constitution or under civil rights legislation. The closest that you get to some kind of property interest in the governmental context is a takings case. Uh, where the government says, we are going to take your property to build a school, or we're going to take this neighborhood to build an airport. And essentially people are left without a choice. You will sell your property to the government in one way or another. 
And under the Constitution, the government simply needs to uh, reasonably compensate you for your lost property. That is not extortion. Why is it not extortion? Because it's the government doing it. When you go back to the first video, and I talked about the government being a bad defendant, uh, the government being incapable of committing crime, that's because the essential nature of, of, of forming a government, of adopting a constitution, especially our form of government, means that, that when we formed our government, in theory, in political theory, individuals gave up certain rights to the government and then retained everything that they did not give up to the government. One of the, the rights that they gave up was uh, the right to uh, take property in exchange for reasonable compensation or just compensation. The other right that they gave up was the right to have laws in, enforced against them so long as, as individuals are afforded due process. Most of the things that the government does would be illegal if private people did it. Uh, the government extorts taxes. Nobody else could, could imprison you if you refuse to pay the money, but the government does it all of the time. And as long as the government provides due process, it's not a wrongful use of force, violence, or fear, which is the only kind of uh, activity that is prohibited by the extortion statute 1951, wrongful. A government's doing this kind of activity is not wrongful as long as they provide due process. And if they don't provide due process, then you have a constitutional challenge. You don't have a criminal challenge. But people will come back to me and say, well, well, well what's that language under color of official right? What does that mean? If my city council decides to uh, eminent domain my house, uh, they are doing it under color of official right. And isn't that prohibited by the Hobbes Act? No, the Hobbes Act prohibits extortion under color of official right. When a city eminent domains a piece of property, it's doing it under official right. Color of official right means that the authority is purportedly official, but actually for personal benefit. And that's where the cases kind of draw the line. If a government agent, you can never sue the government for criminal activity, let's put it that way. Uh, it's, it just can't be done because of all the reasons that we talked about in the first video. But if you've got a corrupt government agent, that agent will only be liable for extortion under color of official right if that agent is using its official authority to obtain some kind of personal benefit. For example, uh, you have a judge that, that says to a criminal defendant, unless you pay me $10,000, I'm going to throw you in jail. Uh, that would be extortion under color of official right. The judge is using his position to convict and sentence the defendant to obtain a personal benefit, to obtain $10,000 going into his personal bank account. If you've got a city council member and the city council member comes to you, a business person, a real estate developer, and says, I'm not going to approve the zoning changes for that property unless you give me a unit in the apartment building that you're going to that you're going to build on that property that would be extortion under color of official right the the city council member trying to obtain a condominium let's say in exchange for the exercise of his or her official discretion extortion under color of official right does not occur when a city council member simply says i'm not going to change the zoning on this piece of property unless you pay for the sewer and water connections to that piece of property. I'm not going to approve the zoning unless we as the city council agree to a higher tax rate for that piece of property. A judge doesn't engage in extortion by telling someone that they will not see their children until they go through drug counseling. In all of those instances, the beneficiary is not the governmental agent personally. In those instances, it's simply a government agent acting on behalf of the government agent to fulfill a statutory duty. When I'm confronted with these cases, I generally look to where the economic benefit runs. If the economic benefit runs to the governmental entity, you don't have extortion, most likely, because uh, even if the individual agent is, is engaged in a lot of egregious behavior, they are probably protected by the governmental immunities that would normally apply to that agent. A good case uh, that, discuss, that discusses these uh, principles is Wilkie versus Robbins. It's a Supreme Court case from uh, 2007. 
The site is 551-US-537. And in Wilkie, you had a rancher out in the Western United States who was in an ongoing, long, drawn-out dispute with the Bureau of Land Management, Federal Bureau of Land Management. And essentially what it boiled down to is the Bureau of Land Management wanted to take this rancher's property without paying for it. And so the Bureau of Land Management and its agents did all kinds of, of, of things to interfere with the rancher's use of his property. They interfered with his roads. They interfered with his bridges. They put up fences. They, 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 they engaged in some pretty nasty activity. But the agents for the Bureau of Land Management were doing it all in their capacity as agents for the Bureau. There was never any evidence that the agents personally benefited for their conduct against the rancher. And the Supreme Court essentially held in the Wilkie case that uh, in order for extortion to occur, the government agents must themselves benefit personally from the, the threats or the use of power. And here, uh, they were simply exercising their authority on behalf of the Bureau of Land Management. Now, if, as agents of the government, they overstepped their bounds and they were actually trying to take property without paying just compensation for it, uh, the rancher might have a claim under the Constitution or he might have a claim under some other uh, statutory provision, but not a criminal claim under RICO. That is an important uh, rule to remember when you're dealing with extortion under color of official right. You're not dealing with wrongful threats when government agents are operating under their authority and they are not personally benefiting. They are not taking property from you for their own personal use. They are taking your property for the benefit of whatever governmental entity they are working for. And, um, and again, you might have other remedies under the Constitution, but, but not under RICO. The second criteria under Section 1964C is the injury by reason of the RICO violation. For many years, people debated the extent to which there had to be a causal link between the acts of racketeering and the plaintiff's injury. Courts didn't know whether actual but-for causation was adequate or whether a plaintiff needed to prove both but-for causation and proximate causation. And like so many issues under RICO, that debate went on and on and on until 1992 when the Supreme Court issued its opinion in Holmes versus Securities Investor Protection Corporation. That decision is found at 503 U.S. 258. Uh, again, that's a 1992 decision. And in the Holmes case, the Supreme Court decided that RICO's by reason of language requires a plaintiff to prove not just actual causation, not just but for causation, but a plaintiff must also prove proximate cause. And the Supreme Court went on to discuss what it meant by proximate cause in the context of RICO. And this discussion is important because, as we know, under the common law, proximate cause is usually a question of fact. But what the court in Holmes pointed out was that proximate cause has often been considered a question of law, which uh, enables the court to impose certain policy limitations on whatever cause of action they are considering, especially statutory causes of action like RICO. And so the court said, here we use proximate cause to label generically the judicial tools used to limit a person's responsibility for the consequences of that person's own acts. At bottom, the notion of proximate cause reflects ideas of what justice demands or of what is administratively possible and convenient. And I think that reference to administrative convenience is important. We're not talking about limiting the scope of, of anything more than convenience here. If a judge thinks that a RICO claim is simply inconvenient or not administratively possible, they can use proximate cause as a judicial tool to limit RICO's scope and courts do it all the time. I said before in the first video that you can do everything right in alleging a RICO claim, but still end up with the claim getting dismissed because so many of the rules are subjective. RICO's proximate cause requirement is the most subjective standard under RICO. It is entirely discretionary and I think 
a very subjective standard that the judges are allowed to implement. Uh, the Holmes case, the facts were fairly complicated, but essentially in Holmes, the Supreme Court held that a RICO plaintiff is not liable to a defendant that causes only an indirect injury. So if you have an intervening third party victim, then uh, you don't have direct injury, you don't have proximate cause under RICO, and thus you don't have standing to seek relief under Section 1964C. The Holmes case is, 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 is complicated because it involves a bankruptcy of a, a brokerage house and a, a group of investors and the brokerage house failing. And, and then uh, after the bankruptcy is filed, the bankruptcy trustee steps in uh, on behalf of all the creditors of the brokerage house. And uh, a group of investors basically sues the principals of the brokerage house claiming uh, that they're entitled to recover their losses. And the court held, no, uh, the directly injured victim was the brokerage house itself. And uh, given that the brokerage house is in bankruptcy, uh, it would be unfair to allow the indirectly injured investors to kind of leapfrog the bankruptcy process and get a big damage award from the brokerage house principals themselves. The directly injured party is the brokerage house, the receiver in bankruptcy, has the right to sue the principals and recover whatever may be recovered on behalf of all creditors, not just the investors that brought the litigation. That's generally what happened. A simpler case that reflects this rule is, is a case of Firestone versus Galbraith, which is a Sixth Circuit case from 1992. The Firestone case is found at 976 F. Second 279. And in Firestone, a woman who had been married to her first husband and had children, when her first husband died, she married a second husband. And as she grew older, she grew more feeble mentally. And uh, allegedly, in her diminished mental state, the family of the second husband looted her estate and left her penniless at the time of her death. So the beneficiaries of her estate, which were the children from her first marriage brought a claim against the second family alleging that they had engaged in all of this fraud to essentially rob the decedent's assets during her lifetime and the court said uh, no you're not the directly injured victim the directly injured victim was the decedent uh, who was defrauded during her lifetime and then when she died uh, the estate stepped into her shoes and the estate has standing to sue the second family to recover these losses, not the beneficiaries of the estate. That's a, a much more simple fact scenario and much more easy context to understand this rule in. Another uh, scenario that comes up quite often involves uh, corporations and their shareholders. Many times you will see shareholders trying to bring derivative claims against the officers of the company and RICO doesn't change the derivative rules. If, if the company itself is the directly injured party and the shareholders are only derivatively injured, then they have to follow the, the rules for derivative litigation to bring the RICO claim. Uh, RICO is not a way to circumvent that process. And all of those cases basically stand for the idea that to have proximate cause under RICO, you as the plaintiff need to be the directly injured victim. If there's another victim, that intervenes in the chain of causation and is a more directly injured victim, then you don't have standing. And unlike tort cases where you can maybe have experts testify about what uh, injuries were caused at different levels of causation, in a RICO case, judges are much more likely to dismiss because under Holmes and other cases, only the directly injured plaintiff has standing, indirectly injured plaintiffs do not have standing. Another uh, event that can break the chain of causation in a RICO situation is the intervention of non-predicate acts. This concept comes from a case that actually predates Holmes. This concept comes from Zedema versus Imrex Company Incorporated, a 1985 Supreme Court case, 473 U.S. 479, in IMRX, basically the court was frustrated because lower courts were adopting some pretty 
nonsensical rules to get rid of RICO claims. And the court rejected those nonsensical rules. And the court suggested, hey, rather than adopting these silly rules, look to the statutory language and use that language to come up with rules that make sense. In particular, the court looked to some of the language in 1964C that related to standing. The court said the plaintiff only has standing if and can only recover to the extent that he has been injured in his business or property by the conduct constituting the violation. As the Seventh Circuit has stated, a defendant who violates Section 1962 is not liable for treble damages to everyone he might have injured by other conduct, nor is the defendant liable to those who have not been injured. Well, that provision relating to the defendant of being liable to those who have not been injured, that was that was the factual scenario in the Holmes case. And uh, other courts had long considered the argument that civil plaintiffs injured by activity not prohibited under RICO don't have standing. For example, plaintiffs have standing if they're injured by reason of the acts of mail and wire fraud, by reason of extortion, by reason of interstate transportation of stolen property. Those plaintiffs have standing under 1964C. But if you're injured by reason of negligence, if you're injured by reason of breach of contract, if you're injured by reason of product liability, those acts do not give rise to standing under RICO. Negligence, breach of contract, product liability are not acts of racketeering and do not confer standing under RICO. A case that I, that I use to demonstrate this principle is a case out of the Fourth Circuit, Brandenburg versus Zeidel, 859, Fed Second, 1179, a Fourth Circuit case from 1988. In Brandenburg, uh, it, was a, it was a claim that arose out of the collapse of the savings and loan industry. And the plaintiffs were essentially alleging that regulators, the state insurance company, failed to oversee the activities of the savings and loan industry. And as a result, when the savings and loans failed and the state didn't have enough money to cover all of the depositor losses, the regulators themselves should be held liable under RICO because they made promises in advertising and elsewhere that depositors' funds were insured. And essentially, because of their negligence, the state regulators had no idea whether depositors' funds were actually insured. And the state regulator in Brandenburg was this entity called uh, MSSIC. The court said, while the MSSIC defendant's negligent failure to prevent unsound financial practices at MSSIC's member institutions may have contributed to the run and thus to the plaintiff's injury, acts of negligence, such as ensuring that the savings and loan had adequate capital reserves and ensuring that the uh, officers of the savings and loan were not using assets for their personal benefits, are not predicate acts under the RICO statute. And Section 1964C provides no cause of action to individuals injured by conduct other than predicate acts of racketeering activity. If you're injured by acts of, of negligence, breach of contract, breach of fiduciary duty, statutory state statutory violations, other federal statutory violations, you don't have standing. To have standing under 1962C, you have to allege an injury by reason of the acts of racketeering. And earlier I talked about how Section 1962 A and B claims are hardly ever successful in the civil context. It's because in the civil context, you need to prove injury by reason of the investment of the proceeds of racketeering activity under Section 1962 A. And under 1962 B, you need to prove injury by reason of the acquisition or maintenance of control over the enterprise. In my book, I describe a few hypothetical scenarios where those kinds of injuries might result in the civil context, but by and large, almost every RICO plaintiff that I run across is injured by the acts of racketeering activity themselves, which are actionable only under 1962C, not A and B. If you're looking for a, a broader discussion of those differences in the standing requirements for Section 1962A and B versus 1962C, I would direct you to the Lightning Lube versus Whitco case, 4F3rd 1153, Third Circuit 1993. It has a very uh, good and informative discussion about why uh, the standing requirements are different for A and B claims versus C claims. And then finally, when proving proximate causation, a plaintiff also needs to prove but-for causation. 
like in like in, in in any tort case, you have to prove but for actual causation, and also you need to prove um, proximate cause. In my practice, I think but for causation is a big issue under RICO when you're dealing with scenarios or dealing with when you're dealing with damage claims for lost profits or for diminished property values. Because essentially, you have to argue that but for the defendant's fraudulent statements, the business would have generated X amount of profits over a given period of time, or property would have appreciated X amount over a given period of time. And in both of those scenarios, whether it's a lost profit claim or a property value claim, a lost property value claim, we all know that so many factors impact uh, profitability of a business and the appreciation of property that it's almost impossible to prove that but for a defendant's fraudulent acts, those damages would have occurred. There are so many independent intervening factors that may have come into play that still may have prevented the plaintiff from achieving those profits or may have prevented the property from uh, reaching that value. The case that I go to on this principle is a case called First National Bank versus Gelt Funding out of the Second Circuit, 27F3rd, 763, uh, 1994. The Gelt Funding case was a situation uh, that arose out of the collapse of the real estate market in New York City during the early 90s. And uh, after the real estate market collapsed, this particular lender went and looked at its portfolio and it saw all of these bad loans. And lo and behold, many of the properties uh, that secured the bad loans were appraised by a particular uh, group. The lender filed a RICO claim alleging essentially that the defendant had fraudulently appraised the properties many, many years earlier. And that as a result of the appraisals, the lender decided to loan money and then as a result of those loans, the lender lost money when the market collapsed. The Second Circuit rejected that theory of causation, saying that there was no proximate cause. And uh, in doing so, it commented on the Holmes rule. It said that the proximate cause requirement means that the plaintiff must prove both transaction and loss causation. Thus, in addition to showing that but for the defendant's misrepresentations, the transaction would not have come about, the defendant must also show that the misrepresentations were the reason the transaction turned out to be a losing one. Now, the transaction loss causation standard is a standard from securities fraud cases, uh, which the Second Circuit is very familiar with. But it also does apply to these situations where you're dealing with lost profits and lost property values to give you some kind of context in which to judge whether or not the fraud caused the loss or something else. For example, in the case of First National Bank, the courts would say, we will concede that but for the appraisal, uh, you would not have loaned money on the basis of this property. But that's not why the transaction turned out to be a losing transaction. For many years, perhaps many decades, you made money off of this loan. The owner of the building paid you on the loan. You collected interest, you collected principal. Everything worked fine, even if the appraisal was not entirely accurate. The reason why this ultimately turned out to be a losing transaction was because the real estate market collapsed, not because the appraisal was false. And so that's a way in which uh, you, can, you can understand how the transaction and loss causation standard works. The plaintiff couldn't prove that, but for the fraudulent appraisal, the losses would not have occurred. The appraisal could have been absolutely accurate, but when the real estate market collapsed, the lender still would have lost the loan. And uh, of course, the Second Circuit was well aware of many loans where the appraisals were perfectly accurate in New York City at that point in time, and the lender still lost money. And I like this language from the Second Circuit in the first National Bank case, again, pointing out how proximate cause under RICO is a legal question, not a fact question. It is a legal uh, issue that can be resolved by the court itself on a motion to dismiss or a motion for summary judgment. The Second Circuit states, we have recognized that the proximate cause determination is not free from normative legal policy considerations and indeed involves a judgment based upon some social idea of justice or policy. 
And that goes back and echoes the Supreme Court's comment in Holmes, the proximate cause essentially allows judges to get rid of cases that are administratively inconvenient. It's a legal issue, and many federal judges will dismiss RICO claims uh, on the basis of the of proximate cause, even though in tort cases, fact issues like that might be allowed to go to the jury. The Second Circuit points out how the value of a piece of property could be impacted by external factors having nothing to do with the appraisal, having nothing to do with the competency of the appraiser, uh, just because the real estate market is subject to so many market forces. The Second Circuit says the value and profitability of a multi-unit apartment complex in New York depends upon many factors that influence the general real estate market, including changes in rent control laws, property taxes, vacancy rates, the level of city services provided, and increased operating expenses, including electric and heating oil prices. Given the complexity of the New York real estate market and the fact that FNB's losses came in the wake of a downturn in the real estate market, FNB must allege loss causation with sufficient particularity that we can determine whether the factual basis for its claim, if proven, could support an inference of proximate cause. And the court decided that no, the plaintiff could not do that in, in this case, that the plaintiff could not prove that there was anything more than a very volatile real estate market in New York City during the time period between the entry of the loan and the loan going into default, and that many factors influenced the value of that piece of property and whether it could adequately secure the loan, and that fundamentally the transaction turned into be a losing transaction because of this downturn in the real estate market. And again, when you're looking at the profitability of a business, uh, profitability can be affected by so many things. It can be affected by the price of whatever natural resources you have to use to, to make your product. It can be affected by the market in which you sell you, your product. It can be affected by uh, the costs of doing business, like labor costs and the costs for energy. So it's very difficult for a plaintiff to prove that, but for the defendant's fraud, uh, they would have necessarily achieved a certain level of profitability. And again, in some tort cases, uh, courts will allow experts to testify on that type of an issue. And even under RICO, some courts may allow experts to testify, but there are plenty of judges out there that understand this rule and that will apply it very strictly when it comes to factors such as this, where you've got really substantial issues indicating uh, problems in proving but-for causation. Many, many independent factors, a, a long, long chain of causation that depends on many, many conditions being met and the plaintiff making assumptions at each, at each link in the chain of causation. And if any one of those assumptions is wrong, then the chain breaks. Courts just won't do that in the context of RICO. Many courts won't. So uh, that's RICO's proximate cause requirement in a nutshell. I also want to talk a little bit about RICO's conspiracy provision, which is found in 1962 subdivision D. Many people consider RICO itself to be a conspiracy statute. It's, it's really not. Like I said in the first video, RICO is designed to impose liability on the kingpin, the godfather that never gets his or her hands bloody by engaging in any actual criminal activity themselves. They just operate and manage a group of, of people that engage in the crime. Unlike conspiracy, the godfather figure doesn't need to agree about what the enterprise is doing, doesn't need to authorize specific criminal activity. It's enough that the godfather figure simply operate and manage an enterprise knowing that it's engaged in, in acts of criminal activity. And so RICO is directed at that godfather figure. RICO's conspiracy provision uh, extends the, the scope of liability under RICO to people who are not operators and managers, to people who may not be uh, the godfather type figure. A conspiracy is very helpful when you've got third parties that may be on the periphery of a scheme to defraud but aren't, aren't engaged in the daily activities of the scheme to defraud in the, in the enterprise. The conspiracy provision is helpful when you're dealing with a defendant who perhaps committed one act of racketeering activity but did not engage in a pattern of racketeering activity. In those situations, RICO's conspiracy provision is very, very helpful in 
and extending the scope of liability to reach these incidental players. In the civil context, a RICO conspiracy claim essentially requires three things to be established. Number one, you need to establish that someone violated RICO. You need to establish that there was a godfather, there was a kingpin that operated and managed an enterprise through a pattern of racketeering activity. When you read some of the cases under RICO's conspiracy provision, they will talk about attempted violations of 1962C, or they will talk about failed schemes to violate 1962C. Those are generally criminal cases because obviously uh, you, can, you can engage in crime regardless of whether or not the crime ultimately succeeds in depriving anyone of money or property. But in the civil context, because you have this civil standing requirement that the plaintiff must be injured in their business or property, usually failed attempts to violate RICO don't give rise to civil standing. So in the civil context, you, you essentially have to prove that someone was successful in violating 1962C. I always say there can be no conspiracy to murder unless somebody gets murdered. That's true under RICO. You can't have a conspiracy to violate 1962C unless somebody violates 1962C. The second thing you have to prove is an agreement to the overall criminal objective. And that rule was announced by the Supreme Court in Salinas, which is a 1997 case. In Salinas, the issue was uh, to prove a violation of RICO's conspiracy provision, uh, do you have to prove the uh, requirements of the general federal conspiracy statute, which requires that a defendant commit one or more overt acts in furtherance of the conspiracy? The Supreme Court said no, the general federal conspiracy statute does not apply to RICO that when Congress passed Section 1962D, it meant a more common sense, a more common law oriented type of conspiracy. And in that regard, then all that the prosecutor plaintiff needs to prove is an agreement to the overall criminal objective, regardless of whether a defendant committed an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. Uh, that being said, the court said, an agreement to the overall criminal objective could be demonstrated by any act committed by the conspirator in furtherance of or to facilitate the 1962 C violation. But it's important to remember that only a, an agreement to the overall criminal objective is required. And then finally, in the Beck case, which is a 2000 case found at 529 U.S. 494, uh, the Supreme Court said you can't circumvent RICO's proximate cause requirements by, by pleading a conspiracy and then pleading that you were injured by reason of some act in furtherance of the conspiracy, even though that act was not an act of racketeering activity itself. For example, uh, if the defendants were engaged in acts of racketeering activity against their customers, perhaps a, a fraudulent advertising campaign or something of that nature, you would not have standing to bring a civil RICO claim if you objected to the false advertisement and were fired because of that. Wrongful termination is not an act of racketeering activity, and so you wouldn't have standing to bring a 1962C claim, so you don't have standing to bring a conspiracy claim either. Whether it's 1962C or 1962D, you still need to prove injury by reason of an act of racketeering activity, and you can't circumvent those proximate cause requirements by, by alleging that you were injured by some non-predicate act in furtherance of the overall criminal objective. So like I said, the conspiracy provision is very helpful in expanding RICO's liability to third parties who are on the periphery of a larger RICO violation. Finally, I want to talk briefly about RICO's statute of limitations. If you look at RICO's substantive provisions, you will not find a statute of limitations anywhere in RICO, and that's because Congress neglected to provide RICO with a statute of limitations, and, and unlike criminal liability, there is no general federal statute of limitations. So for many years, people debated, well, what is the statute of limitations applicable to RICO claims? That debate was resolved in 1987 when the Supreme Court decided the case of Agency Holding Corporation versus Malley Duff and Associates. And in that case, the, the court adopted the Clayton Act's four-year statute of limitations period because RICO's civil remedies provision was essentially borrowed from the Clayton Act. And so the court said, well, if Congress had considered a statute of limitations for RICO, it probably would have borrowed the Clayton Act's 
statute of limitations as well, so that's what we're going to do. So just like the Supreme Court essentially rewrote the pattern definition, the Supreme Court also wrote into RICO a statute of limitations, which is four years. The next controversy that arose was when does the statute of limitations begin to run? When does the statute of limitations accrue? And that debate went on and on and on for many years. There were several competing rules, and most of them were concerned with this idea that, that a RICO claim could accrue before a pattern comes into existence. For example, people were concerned about plaintiffs who might be injured by the first act of racketeering activity, and then the defendant takes off four years, but then in year five comes back and commits two, three, four, five, six acts of racketeering activity, and then a pattern can be alleged. And people were afraid that, well, this poor plaintiff that was injured in year one, I can't possibly bring a claim within four years because a pattern didn't come into existence until after four years. So what you're telling me is that this plaintiff injured in year one would just be barred from bringing a RICO claim. So many of the accrual rules were designed to address that type of situation. For example, there were three predominant accrual rules. There was the last predicate act rule, which was, which was predominant in the Third Circuit. And that rule essentially held that the statute of limitations did not begin to run until the last act of racketeering that was part of the pattern causing injury to the plaintiff. So that would extend the limitations period you know, very, very long. That rule was, was ultimately rejected in the Clare case. Clare said that um, that rule did not require sufficient diligence on behalf of the plaintiff and was, was unacceptable for that reason. Claire is found at 521 U.S. 179, Claire versus A.O. Smith Corporation. That left two remaining accrual rules, uh, and they were the, the circuits were pretty much evenly split between these two competing rules. The novel approach was an accrual rule that said the statute of limitations doesn't begin to run until the plaintiff discovers both the injury and the pattern of racketeering activity. And then the other largely accepted accrual rule was the discovery of injury rule, which says that accrual is postponed until the plaintiff discovers or reasonably should have discovered their injury. The Supreme Court rejected the discovery of injury and pattern rule in Rotella versus Wood, a 2000 case at 528 U.S. 549. And essentially what the Supreme Court said in Rotella was Rico's a special cause of action, but it's not that special. First of all, and fundamentally, no claim can accrue until all elements of the claim exist. So the whole concern that you have that a RICO claim is going to accrue before a pattern of racketeering activity exists is, is unfounded. If a plaintiff is injured by the first act of racketeering activity and the pattern does not come into existence until year five, the plaintiff obviously didn't have a cause of action under RICO after the first act of racketeering activity because the claim didn't exist. The claim only came into existence in years five, six, seven, uh, in the years after which a pattern came into existence. And so the statute of limitations is never going to run on a RICO claim until all elements exist. Accrual fundamentally requires that all elements of the claim exist before the statute of limitations can even possibly begin to run. So that's one reason why we don't need the discovery of injury and pattern rule. The second reason we don't need the discovery of injury and pattern rule is because a discovery of injury is good enough. There are lots of cases where the accrual rule is the plaintiff discovering or reasonably should have discovered its injury. Medical malpractice cases, pretty much any kind of fraud claim, oftentimes injuries are concealed. And so the court said RICO claims are no different. If a plaintiff can't reasonably discover their injury, we will postpone the running of the statute of limitations until that injury is discovered or reasonably should have discovered. And that is the standard accrual rule, and that rule works perfectly fine for RICO as well. And to the extent that you have a defendant that is fraudulently concealing the pattern or fraudulently concealing the injury, a civil RICO plaintiff, like any plaintiff, also has the benefit of equitable tolling. And of course, one of the doctrines of equitable tolling is fraudulent concealment. There's also tolling by duress and infancy and incapacity. All of the tolling doctrines apply to RICO just as they do to any other claim. And the Supreme Court essentially decided that these other 
tolling principles would adequately protect a plaintiff from running before it had notice of all elements of the claim, even if those elements were being concealed by the defendant. I'm, I'm summarizing a lot of case law and making those statements. The Supreme Court never really comes out and says what the accrual rule is. It basically leaves you with the discovery of injury accrual rule through a process of elimination and explaining why the last predicate act rule is bad. It's bad because it doesn't require sufficient diligence by the plaintiff. The discovery of injury and pattern rule is bad because we don't postpone accrual in any other claim for the discovery of any element other than injury and RICO isn't that special. And uh, tolling principles will protect plaintiffs if they cannot possibly uh, discover the pattern within a reasonable period of time because of fraudulent concealment on behalf of the defendant. That is uh, RICO's civil liability and statute of limitations considerations in a very, very, very small nutshell. As I've said throughout these videos, whenever you come across a scenario that might give rise to RICO liability, you really have to do your, your factual research, you really have to do your legal research, you need to understand RICO law in your circuit and maybe even in your district. And there's no way in which you can engage in too much pre-filing, factual research, or legal research. Again, don't stretch RICO so far that, that its application becomes nonsensical or frivolous or even abusive. RICO, like I said, can be an effective tool if it's being used in situations where the type of conduct at issue is very egregious, criminal, and courts don't have a problem when RICO is being used appropriately. Courts have a problem with RICO when it's used to address normal breach of contract, normal business affairs, normal property situations, normal abuses of governmental power, normal deprivations of due process, normal takings cases. RICO doesn't somehow magically transform all of these much more mainstream causes of action into RICO. It doesn't make these things criminal. And you can't use mail and wire fraud to bootstrap these more traditional causes of action into a RICO claim. And so I just encourage everybody to be very judicious in their use of RICO and to learn as much as they possibly can before they travel down the path of filing a RICO claim. But it is a claim that should be considered when the circumstances are right, and it is a claim that can be very powerful and can be a, a huge arrow in a plaintiff's quiver and a huge headache for a defendant in the right circumstances. And like I said, feel free to give me a call. My contact information is on the slide, and I'll be happy to talk about your situation and happy to give you my two cents. Thanks, and I wish you all the best.